This is Coda Radio, episode 576 for June 25th, 2024. Hey friend, welcome in to Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show. Taking a pragmatic look at the art and the business of software development and the world of technology. My name is Chris, and joining us in the warm, sunny Florida, it's our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. They don't call it hot Miami for nothing. Actually, nobody calls it that. No. No. No, but I was, you know, but you know, 90 degrees today or so, it's not, it's not like a super hot day, but it's, No, I uh, mean, it, 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 there's not a heat advisory today. Uh, last week we had one where the governor comes out and is like, uh, if you're old or sick or just, you know, a person, maybe don't don't go outside. But for like large portions of the year, you can't leave your phone in the car without overheating it, basically. That's your life, right? Oh, yeah. For most, yeah most of the year. Weird. Yeah. Weird. Like I have the opposite problem. For most of the year, if I leave my battery, if I, li- if I were to leave the phone in the car, the battery would get damaged by the cold. <laughs> no, yeah. Florida is... Uh... It's, it's a bit caliente. You know, as we always say on the show, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, a 100%. And uh, it's pretty wise. And the new scientists proved it. They looked back nine years ago at the Ashley Madison site debacle, looked at emails and internal records, and realized that uh, we're all living in Ashley Madison land now. Now, for those of you that don't remember, it came out rather controversially that the Ashley Madison website was... Not only kind of appealing to people who were cheating, I believe, but also mostly bots. It had like a handful of actual women on the site and then like 70,000 bots. And uh, they they reviewed over 11 million interactions that were logged in the database between men and female, quote unquote, bots. Of course, the men paid for every single message they sent too. for most of their millions of users. Ashley Madison Affairs were entirely a fantasy built out of Threadbare chatbot pickup lines like how are you and what is up, the article says. <laughs> but uh, they did a day, they looked at the uh, company data dump and discovered that uh, there's like a small amount of women, like a handful of women that were responsible for kind of priming 70,000 bots with things to say. But uh, they point out in the article, and I'm curious, new, new scientist says, and I'm curious if you agree with this take. Nine years later, this could describe any number of social media sites that have become swamped with bots and AI-generated absurdity. And they charge you for the privilege of interacting with techno-phantoms. Currently, Facebook is trying to figure out how to deal with millions of fake images generated by AI, while Google's AI bot overview is telling you to glue cheese to pizza. The problem is human beings are interacting with these AI images and suggestions, in some cases imagining they are engaging with real people. The whole internet has become the Ashley Madison of 2015. And the more we want to talk to each other about it, the less likely we're fi- we are to find a human to talk to. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree with that. In fact, I've been uh, on, on good old LinkedIn doing more content marketing for Alice, not to be confused with her wayward cousin, Ashley. Uh, <laughs> and I'm starting to question the value of this so-called inbound marketing stuff. Uh it used to work. It used to be good, but it's really trivial to like generate a skeleton of a of a post and a white paper in ChatGPT or, or even Gemini, and you know fl- flood the zone, right? My my in, in fact, I, I mean I don't know this for sure, but I have a pretty good idea that either most of my connections on LinkedIn have hired full time lead generation people. Or they're aggressively using ChatGPT to generate content that they post like every other day. Yeah, I agree with you there. I see that a lot. But it's so obviously recognizable as ChatGPT content. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you want to do that, you have to edit it, right? You have to actually go through and like give it some some humanity. At least run it through Grammarly for God's oh. sake. <laughs> I, I do have one problem with this Ashley Madison story. Um, and it's that I didn't think of this. What an amazing way to screw people over and make a ton of money and the people you're screwing over are unlikely to complain because they right, they're mostly right, cheating they'd expose themselves also mike what i find fascinating and you're just on the verge of it this was an outrageous scandal that destroyed the company and became worldwide news for multiple weeks when it happened nine years ago if it happened today this company would be worth billions because of how they're deploying ai 
I mean, I usually don't name names, but I, I think these folks, and I'm sure they're wonderful people, and I, I don't mean that sarcastically. I'm sure they're they're fine people, right? Uh, but the folks behind the Replica Bot, this is basically their business model. It is a uh, cyber, you know, cyber affection bot. We'll put it in in kid friendly terms. That and they they oh, they market it like that. Um, in fact, that's I tried it out. I bought a subscription not for that purpose because at first they marketed it as like an assistant. But very quickly, it goes from, what are you doing today, to what are you wearing? <laughs> it's like it's like a frat boy, basically, or sorority chick. I think it's com- it's companionship as a service, and it's going to be massively popular. And that's really what Ashley Madison probably was. I mean, I, I, I have to wonder, like, with the, well, with the Ashley Madison uh, situation, I, I'm sure these men did believe that they were talking to real women, right? Like, there, there is yeah, an element of yeah. fraud there. But again, who's... Unless you already got caught, who is going to swear out the affidavit to have a prosecutor take this case? And also, it's been nine years. Yeah, it it is kind of beautiful in that sense. Yeah. I actually think looking at this, the takeaway I have, because I would argue, I realize they were cheating, but often there's a loneliness there. And I would bet you a lot of these men were lonely. And if you look at some of the AI apps that are the most successful on iOS, it's these it's these virtual girlfriend chatbots that have. Have you looked at Replica? No. Should I go look at? It, I'll it, go look it, at. It's exactly what you're saying. It is a. It is a virtual girlfriend. It, you can make it male too, but it, you know, let's be honest. It's like probably like ninety something percent uh, female, female yeah. oriented. And it's. I, I do wonder if that's not like a road to destruction for folks, though. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. like I know yeah, there's absolutely. like guys who I remember I used to know a guy who was like kind of weirdly into a couple Twitch streamers. Uh, now he yeah. was a kid, though. Oh, Twitch streamers are going to look like black and white television. By the once you get something like replica AI, and then you get AR, so that way your virtual AI has a physical like presence in your room. It's game over, man. Yeah, it's absolutely game. It's absolutely. For some folks that are extremely lonely because – and I, I would not have said this uh, six months ago until I saw the stats for the companionship apps. And then this Ashley Madison uh, from the New Scientist, whatever it is, comes out. I'm like, hmm. There is like a fundamental need for companionship these people seem to be seeking out. And they can get some sort of artificial version of it. You know, it's the microwave meal version of a relationship. I almost feel like you know the the service we use uh, for the Ju- we you the Jupiter Broadcasting uh, events like meet the Meetup app is a much better solution than than AI girlfriends. I know it's not the same thing, yeah, but like yeah. it could, ultimately, it's like you're saying, like a microwave meal. It's empty calories, right? It's not. There's no. It's not real. I wonder if it uh, if it if it doesn't actually become a big problem because there is you know a a fundamental lack of re- of realness to it, and eventually it doesn't work. It hollows out, you know, and you go seek out actual human companionship. Because I do actually think it's probably intrinsic in most of us to seek out actual companionship. And these are sort of like a stand-in. See, my fear is it becomes some form of addiction where it, it kind of consumes the person and they – you know, the guy, right? We're talking about probably – let's be honest, teenage boys – Probably the right. Uh, Everybody's going to become Barkley from Star Trek. Exactly. That's exa- that is a deep cut. That that was bravo. <laughs> yeah, the deck. The guy gets holiday. Right. Okay. Well, the, the, they have a <laughs> few episodes like this, right? Where, uh, what's the one? Um, is it Barkley? The one where like his wife was killed, his family was killed, and he just like won't leave the holodeck because he made you know virtual versions of them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's real. I think it's, is that DS nine. That might be DS nine, right? And then there's also one where the doctor makes a virtual family in Voyager. That's right. That's right. And it's but it becomes like it really like messes them up. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, this is uh, as always, Coda Radio bringing you the happy news of the day. Right. That seems to be our trick now. Although it, you know, it's just because there's something about AI where this is the this is the avenue it goes down. But uh, just to circle back, I didn't get your response. Can you just appreciate? Can you just bask in the irony that if this Ashley Madison stuff happened today, not only would they be secretive about it, but it'd actually be like the thing that it makes the business it, money. If it happened today, it'd be the thing they that would brings IPO value. tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah. <laughs> Coder.show slash boost. 
Could there be a better way to support an independent program than an independent payment network? And a boost lets you send a message that we read on the show when it's 2,000 sats or above. And there's great news for our audience in the UK that's wanted to participate but hasn't really had a chance. Strike this week launched in the UK just after their EU rollout. And Strike, I think, is one of the best platforms out there. Run by Jack Mahler's. It's an all-Bitcoin company. So they're not messing around with all those casino scam coins. They just focus on the only crypto, Bitcoin. And you buy your sats, they support the Lightning Network, and you can actually boost the Coder Radio program from Strike directly. If you go to coder.show slash boost, it'll take you to Fountain FM's website, where you can boost from the web now without even having to have a Fountain app or an account. It's so great because if you use the Strike app, it'll scan the QR code, send your sats and your message right along. They go directly to us using the split system. Everybody gets a little bit, and it supports the show and the whole network. You can also support us with a membership at coder.show slash membership. You get access to the Coder program ad-free, the Coderly, and support us using your Fiat Fund coupons, which we're just happy for the support. Either way, boost or membership, we thank you very much. Check it out at coder.show slash boost and coder.show slash membership. As we record, it's Tuesday, the 25th of June in 2024. And yesterday, the EU announced that their primary findings show that they are in violation of several of their rules, including the new ones under the DMA. And they are also, their anti-steering committee is launching a, a investigation into other aspects of Apple. It's a whole wide range with up to 10% of Apple's global annual revenue as a potential fine. This is a massive story, and it actually, it just got bigger today as we sat down to record. Just before we went live, they also announced a massive investigation into Microsoft, and in the press release, they kind of tout this, this new strategy that the EU's taking, and CNBC covered it. Teams, Deirdre, they're stifling competition. We'll break open big tech versus break them up. That is the motto for European regulators. So it's break open versus break up. How do you like that? Isn't that something? So we're not going to break them up anymore. We're going to let them have their monopoly, but we're going to make sure you get an API that you can suckle off of. <laughs> That's their strategy. You know, the big tech firms are happy about that, right? Because yeah, right. they get to control and most importantly, rate limit that API. Yeah. Trust me, as a guy who sells a a, a bot effectively or a tool, no, it's less of a bot these days, but a tool that uh, deals with a lot of third party APIs. If you do not get a good relationship with one of those partners, they will rate limit you. It's, it's also just a constant funnel for Sherlocking. Right, yep. you're constantly aware of what everybody's making, creating, what yep. aspects of your business they're using, and how busy and how many customers they have based on the volume. It also doesn't really affect your bottom line. Right, right. All right, so they continue. And so for Microsoft, that means letting more companies in, clamping down on what it calls unfair distribution advantage by packaging teams with others' tools in Office 365. Yesterday, as Kelly mentioned, it was Apple. Regulators accusing it of violating competition rules through the App Store policies. Next, it could be another mega cap the EU has deemed a gatekeeper through its new Digital Markets Act, or DMA. Investors, they don't seem to be worried, not that they really have been in the past. Both Apple and Microsoft shares, they're higher since the charges, but they might want to take note this could be a new chapter in European regulation that is quicker, more proactive, more nimble, and could potentially lead to tens of billions of dollars in fines. Under the DMA, gatekeepers could be fined up to 10% of annual revenue. That could be $21 billion for Microsoft, for Apple, almost $40 billion. Alphabet, Meta, and Amazon, these are the other gatekeepers that the Digital Markets Act is taking aim at. By the way, for Amazon, it could be $55 billion a year billion? in fines. 55. That's a real number. I mean, that's just crazy. To that, I put my pinky up. No kidding. All right, she's almost done. Their potential fines also in the tens of billions of dollars. To put that in perspective, the largest fine ever imposed by EU regulators on a tech company so far, it's only about $5 billion in 2018 against Google. And that was kind of thought of as a parking ticket back then, not hugely significant. So we're talking potentially many magnitudes larger here. Of course, this is the worst case scenario. So those numbers I showed you, Apple and Microsoft will have the chance to argue its case and promote commit, propose commitments to avoid those potential fines. 
But, Kelly, there are some early signs that tougher regulation and the threat of these massive fines are already having an impact. Apple, for example, said that it would block the release of Gen AI features from users in the EU this year due to the DMA and some security concerns. So it could ironically in a sort of- Yeah, it's always curious. You know, like part of me um, wants the EU, which is the only gorilla that's larger than Apple, right? They are the eight, as far as Apple and Microsoft are concerned, the governments are the only 800 pound gorilla that can scare them. Everybody else is is just tiny compared to them. Uh, even you know, even some some governments. And so the reality is, is I sit here and I think we need somebody to 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 have to be a check on Apple's App Store policies and how they operate. But then the kind of getting a little bit older, a little more seasoned, a little more cynical version of me sits here and thinks this always has unforeseen second order effects that are almost always worse than the thing that was trying to be solved. And I can't tell you what it's going to be. But if we if we were to walk these back every single time, there's some kind of like when you really unwind it, there's some kind of negative implication, a distortion in the marketplace that ends up being worse than the original problem that was trying to be solved. So I'm always mixed when it comes to this particular topic, Mike. But, you know, in my pocket right now is a Pixel 7, not an iPhone. I still have my iPhone, but yeah. it's a Pixel 7. And the reason I have a Pixel 7 is because the tomfoolery was stuff in the App Store. It just crossed a threshold with me, you know, about a year ago or more than that now. And I just said, enough's enough. And I don't want to become dependent on a platform that could yank an app out from underneath me that I actually use and depend on. And I still see it today. Apps that I use on the regular every now and then get features just totally removed temporarily so that way they can make it through the App Store. And sometimes those features never come back. And so I do want somebody to put a stop to that because I think the iPhone's a great phone other than that problem. That problem being Apple. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? We got a new, more nimble EU who wants to break them open, not break them up. It's going to be fines, fines, fines. Potentially up to 10% of worldwide revenue. Uh, we're going to have final decision next year in March of 2025 while they try to fight. Something is better than nothing, I feel, in, you know, in this uh, case. I, I do, and I think anybody who's listened to the show for any length of time really will know that I am endlessly annoyed with the hammerlock control that uh, Apple has on uh, iPad OS because I think it is stifling innovation for independent developers and how all developers, right? It doesn't matter, not just the indies. But I think Wes has a good point. It, it is interesting in our chat here. He mentions uh, that they're finding them a meaningful portion of revenue. That's key, right? The the dog, the regu- you know, the, the guard dog has to have some fangs. It can't just be like you know. F- remember what, what was it? The was it the uh, SEC? No, the F- FCC, right? Find Facebook, five billion dollars, and it was literally a bar tab for Mark Zuckerberg. It was just like sure, whatever. Yeah, and. So that was like embarrassing and, and kind of honestly made them look weak and feckless. Having said that, we they already tried this once with the DMA and uh, well, all the companies, but I'm going to pick on Apple because that's the one I'm, I'm most intimately familiar with, found a creative and frankly, very like, you know, slime ball mafia lawyer ways to parse the language. Like, for instance, what exactly does non-steering mean? What's a link? What's a button, right? Right. What exactly is a core technology feature? Right. You're, you're allowed yeah. <laughs> to install apps from other places, but we get to notarize them. Oh, we don't like this kind of app, but we're not notarizing it. They just banned a uh, Windows, a DOS emulator, but they're allowing Game Boy Advanced emulator. Like, they, like, Why? Yeah, and they won't notarize it, so you can't even install it through a third-party app store. I don't think there's going to be a dramatic, you know, a scent of a woman style court case here with Al Pacino, right? There's not going to be, uh, you know, anything like that. I this I think this is all posturing for a negotiated settlement. Likely true. The problem is Apple has enough money, and frankly, the epic chest hair on Craig Federici to just they're going to do things to the English language, assuming the settlement's written in English. That would make the Marquis de Sade blush <laughs> okay, to well, get around whatever terms they agree to. I almost completely agree with you, except 
I think this might be a new normal, and they're showing everybody the way it is by going after the big boys. Because not only are they not happy, but they are launching additional investigations into all the little loopholes and mafia-style language that you mentioned. Uh, The commission's officially investigating Apple's alternative business terms. They're going to investigate the core technology fee. They're going to investigate... All of the stuff that you just mentioned, like they've launched additional investigations now. I just want to say, really, Apple? Hey, Vinny, come on. A nice bar you got here, but I want to talk about some alternative business terms with you, okay? That, like, they're just so brazen with this stuff. I I just, I, I don't get the sense that they're quaking in their boots over at Cupertino. Apple has provided a statement. Oh. Here's what they say. Quote, Throughout the past several months, Apple has made a number of changes to comply with the DMA in response to feedback from developers and the European Commission. We are confident our plan complies with the law and estimate more than 99% of developers would pay the same or less in fees to Apple under the new business terms created. All developers doing business in the EU on the App Store have the opportunity to utilize the capabilities that we have introduced, including the ability to direct App Store users to web to the web to complete purchases at very competitive rates. As we have done routinely, we will continue to listen and engage with the European And that, my friend, is what lo- how lawyers talk. Yeah. So then we got, you got Microsoft uh, getting in trouble for bundling teams. Yeah, this one I think is, this is the stupid one, but you go ahead. I mean, is it though? Think about the timing of this one. Teams is a web app. It's an electron app, isn't it? Yeah, but they, they Internet Explorer style embedded it Right as the pandemic hit. Well, no, it's it's part of the subscription, I thought, was the real issue, that you're basically getting it for free if you bought Office. Yes, that too, that too. So, you know, but, okay, here's the interesting thing about this case against Microsoft. All of this originates from a complaint that was sent in by Salesforce. <laughs> Slack. Yeah, when they bought Slack. Slack was acquired by Salesforce in 2021 for uh, $27.7 billion. Stupid amount of money. Yep. And so they started complaining about this, and this is what it's led to. And uh, Teams has grown from around 2 million worldwide uh, in its first year to now 300 million in 2023, at least. Microsoft Teams just exploded during the pandemic. I I was surprised to see it. It went from a nothing app to, like, a very common app. I know. I've had to use it many, many times. But it's after the fact. They've got the users. They've got the network effect. And Microsoft is pulling this crap, in my opinion, right now— with OneDrive, Microsoft is forcing automatic OneDrive backups. It's They enabled it during clean installs of Windows 7. You install it, and it changes. They've changed the setup process now to enable this by default and do automatic backups. So stuff that you save in, quote, My Documents actually gets saved to Microsoft's cloud servers. So it turns out the My in My Documents actually meant Microsoft's documents. I hate that so much. And they're going to do the same thing. They're going to start crushing Dropbox and others by just baking OneDrive on by default because they've also got you setting up for a Microsoft account now by default in the Windows installer. So they're just onboarding you, not to mention they got two screens of upsells. I don't know if you've installed Windows 11 recently from scratch, but they got like two or three different screens of upsells of their services as well. (laughs) And they're turning this stuff on. They're putting Teams on there, man. They're baking in Copilot. They're doing OneDrive by default. They're just, it's so gross. And, you know, maybe the E will catch on in five years. All right, so I have a question, right? Because I've been thinking about this a lot. If you were to write the ideal regulation, would it, wouldn't it just be if you are the maintainer and developer of the platform, you cannot also be an application developer oh, on it? There's no way. That they, solves there's all. No way they'd ever let that. No way. I understand, but so so like you mentioned Dropbox. I have a client who's using Dropbox. I'm very impressed with how good Dropbox is now. Yeah, they've been around for a while. It's really, it's come a long way. And OneDrive, with apologies to some friends in Chicago, is uh, just terrible. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it's years behind what Dropbox is doing. And the nice thing about Dropbox is they have an API that's, at least stable enough that there's... They have an awesome API, and they're not dicks about rate limiting. <laughs> so, which is, if you've noticed, the theme of the show is I spent... It's only Tuesday, and my week is a dumpster fire because of rate limiting, so... They also, I love uh, Maestral, probably not saying it right, M-A-E-S-T-R-A-L. 
It's an open source Dropbox client for Mac OS and Linux. Really lightweight. Yeah. Or if you're really hardcore, you could use Minio, yeah. which is an open source thing. They have a weird blockchain product that they're pushing now, but basically it's an S3 compliant uh, API compatible. So if you're like doing Ruby or Python, you just can use the S3 gem and your gem or, or, or pit package, right, respectively. And you're good to go if you want to roll your own. I use that for a lot of client work. Um, less so now because if I'm doing Rails, active storage is a thing. You don't have to do all that. But yeah, it. I don't know. I've. I you know I think I'm wrong. I think I agree with you because what I just said is uh, OneDrive is the inferior product, but you are effectively getting it as part of your subscription to Office, and that's why people are using it. Same yeah. with Teams. I I think Slack is. I I use both, but I Slack is obviously better right in my opinion and i will say again slack has a much better api which i find disturbing given microsoft had that whole bot framework which while not successful actually it was a really interesting idea and they really did a nice job like when microsoft cares about it like doing api you know open apis for developers they really do a nice job. They just, it's, it's when you, inter- it's the old picture of, you know, the different divisions at Microsoft pointing revolvers at each other, right? They just, they just can't handle that yet. Your question is a good one though. What would be just kind of a perfect, simple regulation that would sort of prevent this problem? How Microsoft is running away with it right now with OneDrive, integrating into Windows. How would you solve this? Boost it and give us your like two sentence regulation. Or maybe Mike's idea is right. If you're a platform, you can't be an app creator. I just don't for know your you own it. platform. Right, right, absolutely. Right. So Microsoft can totally write like you know Excel for iPad. In, in my now, granted, I don't think there's any. No, you know who actually someone did propose this in in America. Your, your old girlfriend Elizabeth Warren. Oh, oh yeah, she and I are not on good terms Th- anymore. Uh, that went nowhere. Yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. yeah, I think she's like managed to pass two things successfully in her entire term, so it doesn't really surprise me. She's really good at giving uh, interviews, though. Stay a while and listen. All right, I got I got me a story to tell y'all. Uh, I think we're watching how an open source standard gets born, and I have to say I'm not super impressed. I had a tour of the sausage factory, and I saw bits and pieces of things in there I wish I hadn't seen. And this question of what does open source AI mean anyways? Um, Well, a new paper has tried to create a checklist of sorts. It's called the Model of Openness Framework, promoting completeness and openness for reproducibility, transparency, and usability in artificial intelligence. Rolls right off the tongue. I have a link in the show notes. And TechCrunch's Paul Swears dug into this. Uh, He tried asking a few questions, did a few interviews. He interviewed Joseph Jacks who's the open source evangelist and founder of a VC firm called OSS Capital. And he argues there's no such thing as open source AI because what we really need to know are like the weighting and how that worked. It's just so different than traditional software. Uh, We need to know the data and all these kinds of things. So he says you can't really classify them as open source, but the OSI disagrees. And the OSI is, of course, the the body that makes these standards, quote unquote. And they're kind of going on a media tour. For the summer, they're going to be touring around and uh, doing a listening and question tour to ask what people you know feel about open source AI. And then at the All Things Open conference in October, they're going to unveil and codify their new definition of open source AI. And this TechCrunch article rightly points out that the OSI is funded by Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Cisco, Intel, Salesforce, Meta, and others. So there's a lot of these companies that might have some skin in this game. But they're going to call it the MOF. Well, at least that's what's being called right now, the Model Openness Framework, the MOF. And it's a classification system that rates machine learning models, quote, based on their completeness and openness, end quote. MOF demands that specific components of the AI model development be, quote, included and released under appropriate open licenses, uh, saying that it also means training methodologies and details around the model parameters. The OSI is calling the official launch of the definition the, quote, stable version, but they're not calling it a final release. They think parts of it will evolve over the long term. Quote, we can't really expect this definition to last for 26 years like the open source definition. 
I don't expect the top part of the definition, such as what is an AI system, to change much. But the parts we refer to in the checklist, those that list components depend on technology, tomorrow, who knows what technology will look like, end quote. But the stable open source AI definition is expected to be rubber stamped by the board at the All Things Open conference in October, like I mentioned. And uh, the OSI is going on a, quote, global roadshow in the intervening months, spanning five continents, seeking, quote, diverse input on open source AI. And then they're going to present the results in October, as if the whole thing isn't baked and ready to go already. So we're going to get official open source AI, as blessed by the OSI and the members that make up the OSI. I think including training methodologies and details around model parameters is a positive thing. Uh, but don't you really think to really appreciate how these things are built, we need to have insights in what they're getting trained on? Like, does any of this matter if we don't get the training information and the source? I mean, I, I think it, it's very important to get that information, but I don't see how that's going to happen. Also, also, what about like the system operator level? You know how all the all of these have like a core prompt. You are a helpful assistant. You know, like Google's is like you're a helpful assistant that's woke. You know, like they, all these models have like a system layer to them that does filtering and checking that isn't part of the LLM. Shouldn't that also be open source? What am I missing here? Oh, I, I don't think you're missing it. You're just not mentioning it that the <laughs> the Achilles heel, so to speak, of all these AI companies is the fact that they're just rapaciously stealing data yeah the cto of OpenAI. i don't i apologize i don't remember who she was interviewing with but she just basically wouldn't answer the question of where are you getting your data because that's that's like the that's the dirty family secret for all of them right that's absolutely I, did you see goobers uh or gruber's interview uh post wwdc and he asked them where you get where you where are you training this thing and apple basically said you know, we trained it on the open web and we filtered for curse words and things that were extreme, whatever that means, quote unquote. But otherwise, it's just open public data they're training Apple intelligence on. But but is it? They they say, and oh, by the way, they said, if you don't want us to index your website for Apple intelligence, put this, you know, in your robot.txt or whatever. But by the way, we've already indexed it. We both have websites, right? I know you, you have done written content, I believe, right? Transcripts, things like that. I do do blog posts, things like that. Just because I don't put something in a robot.txt file doesn't mean I still don't own the copyright to that. So there you go. I mean, hell, hell look at what went on with ScarJo, right? Or uh, what's her name? Sarah Silverman. They just wholesale ripped off her book. Even Kara Swisher, Auntie Kara. They're producing AI-generated um, counterfeits of her new book, Burn Book. How could you tell? How could you even... How could you even tell? Well, she happens to be Kara Swisher and can call Amazon and get them to take them down, right? I don't know what to say. I mean, it, it's one of those things, like, it seems like they're they're pretty much vagrantly breaking copyright law. Well, it was Google when they made an archive and the, or the Internet Archive. Are they – when they made the Wayback Machine, are they vagrantly vi violating copyright law by having a an archive of the New York Times or, you know, whatever? That's an open question, right? I could tell you the New York Times would say yes because they have a service that does that. Yeah, yeah, but uh, at the same time, the New York Times needs that search traffic. So, uh, yeah, the internet has always – there's always been this struggle between information on the internet, between closed information and public information. And it just seems like on an open, permissionless network, the default is for the information to be permissionless and open as well. All right, we could go. We could go back to like you know, two thousand or even like nineteen ninety six, and say information wants to be free. But I, you know, we're not in those halcyon days anymore. We're not. I don't know, right? The the cult of the dead cow is dead, basically. This is big tech's internet now. Yeah, it's well, the internet's been commercialized. It's siloed now. It's not. It's not what it was meant to be. In in many ways, it's actually the opposite of what it was supposed to be. I so, agree. I agree. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I'm turning into a Baptist preacher here. I'm just basically saying we live on a fallen internet, right? But we do. You know, but there are bastions of hope and new systems. Uh, I mean, this is what this week's Linux Unplugged was all about, is uh, a decentralized open system for identity. Uh, we need system. We need a system like that. And uh, that's where Noster comes in. And I'm not a big, like, Twitter clone guy. 
I don't really even like Twitter, so I'm not really looking for a Twitter clone. But uh, Twitter clone is like the least interesting thing about Noster. The most interesting thing about Noster is notes, relays, and keys. Just a JSON action-based, like, I do a thing, a JSON packet gets sent to a network that gets relayed around, distributed by a bunch of open relays, and it's signed by my key. So you know it's from me. Uh, maybe I, maybe I, maybe me as an application, maybe me as a service provider, maybe me as an individual user. That's what makes Noster compelling, and that that's distributed, censorship-resistant, and essentially a social graph as a service because it does have a social layer to it as well. That That is a system that breaks down individual silos because in that world, you are identified by your keys. So you have a private key and then you have a public key, and that public key has information associated with it like a profile picture, your followers, who you follow, basic profile metadata. And you can take that key across all the different, and there's now hundreds, of Noster applications – Craigslist alternatives, Telegram alternatives, uh, blogging platform alternatives, on and on and on. And you can take that one identity, that one social graph, all your followers across all of the different applications. So if you do something in one application, it could be shown in a different application or it could not based on the filtering you have on the Nostra Relay network. It, it is really interesting from a toying around with the Internet in the way it used to be kind of perspective. I don't know if it'll ever go anywhere. Solve some problems, I think, specifically around silos. But I, you know, we've reached a point of saturation, right? Uh, I mean, if I if I talked about the Bitcoin ETFs six months ago on the show, I doubt anybody bought any. They could, they can't be. Nobody can be bothered. They they would have made nearly like a hundred percent profit or something if they would have. But they can't be bothered. You know, everybody's too busy. I, even if it's stuff that could fundamentally improve your life, like a new way to have identity online that involves Noster. Like people just can't be bothered because everybody is so tapped out. They're so tapped out. They're so busy. They're so heads down. And this is why the young people are the only ones that can be creative and come up with stuff because they haven't filled their lives and tied themselves down so much that they don't have the energy capacity or mental fortitude to pay attention to the new stuff. They don't, they're, not all, they're not all tapped out. And this is the cycle of life. This is the cycle. I, I just, I don't know, but I do find there are pockets out there that are extremely positive and compelling. There is a rapid, rapid, unbelievable amount of application development happening on top of Noster and the Lightning Network. And people are getting paid. They're doing it. Businesses are being built. But you have to be tuned into that world. And if you're not tuned in, like I don't, outside of AI, that's like there's nothing really going on. People are just too busy to be tuned into all this stuff. That's where podcasts come in. That's where, uh, you know, you and I come in. Well... If only we had a boost. <laughs> hey, I like the way you think. Boostagram. We have a boost from VT52, and it is 43,272 sats. He's our lobster this week. Hey, rich lobster! He says, I was disappointed about the sat stack on episode 575, so I'm boosting the same amount, so at least 576 can start where 575 left off. That is brilliant. You're so boost. <laughs> Thank you, VT. I really appreciate that. Tampa Tech Trekkie comes in with 20,000 sats. Make it so. Uh, he says, I'm both for a Zenith mention and the final countdown clip. Did we mention the Zeniths too? Wow. Who the hell those? We went on a rant. <laughs> oh, man. Every episode these days. Yeah, would... yeah until the AI bubble pops. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Or... Should, or... I... Or our beautiful printer resumes its glorious. I, I take everything back. I said bad. I said about the money printer. Baby, come back. We miss you already. Remember the good times? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. West Payne comes in with 3,333 sats. Fun will now commence. He says, uh, to what extent is DHH just choosing one pain over another? Windows has pain. Mac OS has pain. And yes, Linux has pain. Yeah, I think Apple uh, annoyed him, though, right? Yeah, it was. It was really. He said it was the, uh, it was the app store stuff. Uh, what was it? Yeah, no, it was the temporary, but it was the act of preventing the web app icons from going on the desktop and mm -hmm. iOS in the EU. And that for him was the straw. It sounded like in the interview I was listening to, he just like realized, why am I giving this company that I'm just becoming less and less happy with so much money? 
Uh, and I get that. It's, you know, I kind of felt that way about the iPhone, too. It's like you just reach a point, you're like, oh, this is ridiculous. This is just getting unsustainable. And then you also, I think the way I work, and I wonder if DHH felt the same way, is the way I start thinking is, oh, no, I've totally got myself dependent on this. I need to start finding another alternative. And when you start, when you have that realization, you might not even know if there is another alternative that works, right? Because he tried Windows first, decided that wasn't the pain he wanted. But when you do find the alternative that is actually viable, like the level of passion and excitement that it can fire in you can sustain you for months. Like I just, I still think about all the awesome stuff we're doing with Nix OS and mm. Pipewire Audio. And the, I still, that's some of the things that gets me the most excited about technology in the last 20 years. And it's just a different kind of pain, right? Because I could probably learn how to solve some of those problems I'm solving with Nix and Pipewire, with Windows and Ansible or Mac OS and Brew and scripting. I don't know. It's just the pain you want, I suppose. I think it makes sense, right? I mean, in the words of the Klingon prison guard from Discovery Season 1, choose your pain. Yeah, and Kapla. Kapla, of course. Thank you, Wes. Vitamin C++ comes in with 2,000 sets. Uh, Look no further than your nearest REI for another example of a public benefit corporation. Quote, shareholder value, quote, is not the sole ethic available to an organization or for a for-profit corporation around. Shareholder value was stood up in the 1980s as some supreme commandment for the American corporations, but it's not a law of the land or nature, nor economics. Your words are blasphemy. Isn't REI having some sort of massive corporate structure problem? I, somebody that works at REI was complaining to us. So I don't know, but I thank you, Vitamin C. Are. Oh, it's a, like a sports and camping oh, outfitter. Oh, that's right. That's they got like right. those climbing walls. Yeah, yeah. No, they're from my neck of the woods. I love their stuff. So I hope they're doing great, you know. I think they do good work. Remake and Eating comes in with 10,000 sats. Coming in hot with the boost. I wanted to boost to support the ad winter. Thank you. Unfortunately, I've not been streaming sats as much as I jumped into a, a contracting at an interesting time. Mm, yeah, I bet. I got one QA contract, and the bottom has fallen out of the contracting market in the UK, it seems. Nevertheless, I wanted to thank you guys for helping me get here and send my support. Keep it up. Good luck, man. Yeah, seriously. You know, it's if you can make it work... And if you can survive through this at this stage in your business, it will harden you and your business and make you more resilient in the good times. It's as though you joined a fellow – wait, no, I don't think he is from Britain – Kit Harrington. You know, I launched I, – JB became a company in 2008 during the 2008 great financial crisis. <laughs> so – yeah, uh, that's when I, that's when I started my first business. So yeah. I'm like, everybody, this is normal. This is yeah. fine. This is what I'm used to. You got this remaking. Keep us in the uh, loop. You, Thank you. That's the John Snow. That's who I'm thinking of. Oh, okay. Uh, who, who the hell is Kit Harrington? Uh, yeah, you, you're living at the wall, right? You, you'll be fine it's, if you get used to the frostbite. Next time this happens, which it will happen again, you're going to uh, you're not going to take it as hard. Tomato comes in with a jar jar boost. You're so- 5,000 sats. I particularly enjoyed this episode. Keep up the good work. Thank you for sending back a little value, Tomato. Appreciate it. You know, tomato, tomato. Dark Matter PHP dev comes in with 3,500 sats. B-O-O-S-T. Just sending my fountain sats to keep the coder show on the road. Thank you. Appreciate that, Dark Matter PHP dev. I'd love to know what you're working on if you ever want to send another boost in. Give us a little taste of what... uh, PHP Dark Matter Dev, you're doing. Taste of the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, user 1087 comes in with 4,434 sats. It was across two rows of ducks. Hey, guys. Great show. Uh, as a community, let's not scare away new Linux users. Some will be migrating from Windows or Mac OS. Uh, It's easy to tell them they're doing it wrong. There is no perfect way to use Linux and arguing which is better, a package manager, a distro, or configuration, or if you should do things in Bash, uh, it only scares them away. The beautiful thing is Linux is flexible. Shout out to Popey and check out his GitHub for tools he's made. Oh, that's interesting. Hang on. Let's not scare away new Linux users. Mentions Popey. Yeah. (laughs) Are you a canonical? Well, and just new tools too. Like, um, they're not interested in that stuff generally. My point is not to scare them away. But that I don't believe there is an organic, totally new user. You know, I'm picturing, let's just, let's, we'll make somebody up. Like this new user that, you know, it needs a really easy to use Linux desktop that has never used Mac OS and has never used Windows before. So they have no computer experience. 
but they somehow end up with a Linux machine that nobody set up for them, that nobody showed them how to use, that nobody gave them. That seems to be like who the GNOME desktop and these apps that are really minimal and lean and all this talk about easy and all the, it, it, it seems like it's picturing some user that is literally a phantom user. And the reality is a new, if somebody is coming into Linux and they're just like a total computer virgin, they're probably getting a computer set up for them by a friend or a family or a corporation and they can ask questions and they can be shown how to use it. And if there's somebody who's choosing Linux without somebody's help, they've probably used a computer before. So they know how a menu works and a right-click works. And they know how to install software. And they're at a different level. And so I just think as a community, we all have our definition in our heads of what a new user is. And so somehow we've nebulously built towards software to accommodate a user that simply doesn't exist. Well, also, like, the Linux community is not, you know, it's not super large, right, especially desktop. But I remember back in my back in my experimental college days when I was running Brown. Yes, Ubuntu used to be Brown, and there was a big difference between you know R slash Linux and the Ubuntu forums. And as a noob college kid needing help, I would I uh, learned very quickly that you go to the Ubuntu forums, not, that not R slash Linux. That's the tip. Go to the community for the distro you use. That's and for tip. the le- and for the level that you're at. Right when you're yeah, starting out, yeah. you you because the people, even the experienced people, right? Like sometimes some maintainers would be on there. They understand, like Linux, the Linux Mint forums were good too. Like they understand that you're there because Ubuntu and Linux Mint were easy mode at the time, right? That was always the recommendation: get a give a new user a Mint uh, a DVD, right, or a Mint Mint CD, depending. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I I feel like someone like DHH, which I th- I think what he's referencing here is an experienced developer, knows his way around the command line, right? So it maybe makes sense that he would go in with a more hardcore focus. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even with that said, like, I would never give someone, like, trying to run their office with just, like, regular desktop computing, I would probably almost always suggest they do Mint or Ubuntu still to this day because I don't ever want them to touch the command line. Yeah, unless you're managing it for them, right? It makes sense. Right. But then, like, are they going to, like, is that a business? You know, at some point, they're just going to go back to Windows, mm-hmm. if if that's true. So, yeah, I, he, but he has a point. I think mm-hmm. it makes sense. Yeah, I think you definitely can get carried away, especially if it's somebody who just wants a, you know, uh, like, LibreOffice and a printer and a scanner. And they're just doing, like, you know, some spreadsheet stuff and doing some email. You could definitely get carried away and don't want to scare away that user. And I think you're exactly right. In that case, in Ubuntu and Mint, Totally fine uh, for my family uh, because I do support their systems. I just I have them a a really kind of specially defined Nix OS setup. It's kind of like a it's a it's something that works on my son's laptop, one of my daughter's laptop, and my wife's laptop, and it's nice and it's our little configuration, right? And but that's because I'm actively maintaining it. I would never recommend they start with that. Uh, he also sent in some more ducks to give you a recommendation, which I will underscore in plus one. He says Mike should check out Quick MU on GitHub. Really slick script that uh, our buddy Wimpy's behind to set up VMs like really quick. So it is very timely that he sends this. I do appreciate it. I don't know if you saw this, Chris, on Twitter or I think Mass. I don't know where I posted it, but a customer sent me a, a relatively brand well, a brandy new Galago Pro. I think it's the model that is not the one they just released like three weeks ago. Mm. But on it, I'm using uh, QMU to <laughs> emulate Windows. Because I'm porting or I'm rewriting some old Battleship Gray Windows software. And if you're old enough to know what that means, God, there were some really weird UI paradigms back then. Like, disturbingly bad. <laughs> but I'm porting it to a Rails app. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, that's, that's what I'm using. I, I kind of wish I had known about this a couple of weeks ago because I want to make two ver. In fact, I need to make another. So maybe for the other VM, I will use this because it looks really good. And Wimpy, Wimpy knows the stuff, so... You know, I'm such a monster. I have my Plasma desktop at home set up for the classic Windows 7 UI. So it is like that Battleship Gray and just... Nice. It's, I don't know, there's something nostalgic. Oh, no. Are you ready? Yeah. This application was written for XP. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, please, please, Windows 7, you're living in the future, man. I don't know where you are. <laughs> hey, thank you, everybody who boosted. And we had eight boosters across nine boosts total. We stacked a bit more this week, 91,549. So, so close to that 100,000 sat goal. 
Thank you, everybody, though. We really appreciate it. We love your messages. It's a fun part of the show for us. Uh, it's also a great way to interact while kicking back a little value. And also, you get on the podcasting and Tudoro bandwagon, so your podcast app doesn't live and die on the decisions made by Spotify and Apple. Spotify just did a little switcheroo where if you start using their video podcasting option, so say you have an audio podcast and you also turn on the video podcast option, when you turn that on and you upload your first video for your show, they automatically from that point forward stop serving your MP3 files for the audio version from your CDN, rehost it, and then you never see the downloads in your in your dashboard. And you're turning on video, but they make the switcheroo on audio because they're trying to kill RSS. That's what their goal is, is they basically want to have the Spotify directory. And so they're doing all these little things here and there to just screw over the general wider podcast ecosystem and make it the podcasting ecosystem inside Spotify. And the thing that Podcasting 2.0 is trying to do is create a standard that all podcast developers, all podcast listeners, all podcast uh, app developers, you know, everybody that's making an app or creating content or listening to content can follow an open standard in a decentralized way. And some of it's very early still, and some of it's come a really long way. And you can find a whole bunch of new apps at newpodcastapps.com. Fountain FM is really killing it recently. And combined with Strike, which is now available in the EU and the UK, it's easier than ever to participate in the boosts. And we thank everybody who does it. And also a shout out to everybody who streams those sats and our members who kick back every month as part of our Coder QA crew. We really appreciate all of you for supporting the Coder program. Thank you very much. Mr. Dominic, besides giving them a round of applause, you had a little find this week that seems to be pretty interesting. It's dot environment or dot environment X, I guess, dot env. Oh, oh, contraire, mon ami. Not this week. Literally over lunch today. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. So you found something today hot, coming in hot. It loads environment variables from an environment variable file for your Node.js projects. So you create like an dot env file in the root of your project. And then I guess you import and configure that into the project and you're basically done. And now you've got this management system that has all kinds of great features and they're building out a pro version, live even more features down the road. And it also inspired quite the conversation in our team chat today. So it seems like yeah, people are yeah, doing so, so just just a couple of quick quick details here. Uh, it's not just Node.js. So and there's three different things here. There's dot env, which has been around forever, which I use every day in my Rails and Python stuff. Uh, that does exactly what you described, but it does it for, I mean, a lot of shit, right? Rails, Python, Node, mm, mm. whatever. Okay. I, 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 I'm pretty sure the Rust developers are eagerly DMing me on Twitter right now, telling me it works there too. I'm sure, sure, it does. sure, yeah. Uh, that has a problem in that it is very easy. I don't know anyone on this call that's ever done this and had to sheepishly go tell people they need to regenerate their secret keys mm, and stuff. Hmm. But it's very easy to accidentally commit that to the Git repo. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, and that's just a problem. It's also sometimes have different interaction issues because, like, there's a Ruby gem for it. There's a pip package, blah, blah, blah. So the creator of it ha is releasing a successor called .envx, which the big claims to fame are it's the same no matter where you're running it. It has direct support for Docker containers, which... Coder Radio is, I mean, they, they should pay us, but come on. We love you, Docker. Come on. Pony up. And this is the one that saves Mike's sweet tender ass. You can encrypt your secret keys and your secret variables. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. So you're mm. not able, even if you accidentally commit, you're far safer, right, if you commit the file. Uh, on top of that, it standardizes uh, basically the I don't know I don't know if I want to call it an interface, but I, I guess I'll go with interface of how it kind of cooks into your project. Looks really good, kind of early days, but very promising. He is also discussing a service called Dot X Pro, which I think is what you were just talking about. Yeah, yeah. Where it. It's a little vague. You can we put the link in the show notes. I, he's definitely at the ideation phase, and I apologize because I cannot remember his name because I'm an ass. He goes by Mott on his uh, on his Twitter and stuff. I'm sorry on his blog. It seems like it's going to have APIs, uh, team access. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Permission controls. 
And something I'm actually curious about service tokens, which I hope mean that you can kind of bifurcate what users or developers have access to what uh, information. I don't know if that's true. We definitely got uh, had a nice chat. I didn't I didn't respond to all of it yet in our in our Slack, but yeah, there there there's some change. Like you do have to wrap your commands in. It's it's uh, the dot mvx uh, wrapper command. Mm-hmm. But you know this is all early days, and uh, if you know dot env the original version is super standard, super common, widely used. It's actually supported by another. Uh, favorite of my tool that I use every day on both uh, Pop and Mac, the Warp Terminal. So they they are a financial supporter of the project, uh, and they do a lot of the stuff for you. So I'm I'm interested to see where this goes. This is one of those things that a lot of junior developers will overlook. You know, they'll just like hard code the secret key, and everything's okay, everything's okay, until somebody has a laptop stolen, and, you know, bad things happen, right? Yeah, And it doesn't even need to be that dramatic. It doesn't need to be a stolen laptop. So I have been using .env OG for a long time, and I'm probably going to go up to X. I don't know that I'll pay for Pro. I, You know, it's these little... It seems like all these open source... This, You know, we talk about monetizing open source. It seems like a lot of them are going to this model where it's like the open source project and there's some cloud service that you can sub to. Right. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Base features are open source and then like all the new stuff they think of, that all goes in the pro plan. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I will say though, the encryption stuff, which is what I'm primarily interested in, is in the is in the regular open source okay. project. Yeah, and you know, some of it makes sense, right? Like if you're gonna have back end services like the team access and the API stuff and service yeah. tokens, you, you, there is some cost you're gonna you're gonna occur. So there should be some price they're charging. Yeah, I mean, I've subscribed to the GitHub issue. I'm going to keep following this. I, I, I just want to urge you, even if you don't use .env or .envx, you got to not be hard coding your secret keys, man. <laughs> like, just don't do it. Find some solution, even if that solution is, you know, SSHing into the server and putting them in your bash RC or your CH, <laughs> whatever whatever shell you're, you're running. Like, uh... Uh, anything but hard coding them is a lot. Wes was right. I, I I agree with Wes. There was never no ever, never a disagreement on this one. <laughs> like it's yeah. uh, Wes will be pleased that it's Python friendly, of course. So mm. I'm sure you could do it in Closure too. I was going to ask. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. good. Yeah. Well, so it, 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 it's nice that we have an open source project uh, that's interesting. I don't. You know, I mean, I like Warp, but Warp. I have a feeling they're rapidly going to be going commercial pretty soon. Just seems that way. Dot MVX. All right, links in the show notes. Those are at coder.show slash five seven six. Mr. Dominic, is there anywhere you want to send the good peeps before we get out of here? You could go to Alice.dev for all your API integration automation needs. And I still will have some availability next month. So if you need something custom done, uh, and you would like it to be an objective C or more reasonably Ruby or Python, let me know. Yeah, that's a great there you go. Great opportunity right there. I will mention Linux Unplugged, episode 568. You can go to Linux Unplugged 568 and, uh, you know, take a listen to our pitch. See what you think. And, of course, I'm on Weapon X, Chris LAS, the podcast, Coda Radio Show. Domenuku is Mr. Dominic over there. And at Jupiter Signal is the podcast. I mentioned our links at the Coder.show website. We also have our contact form, the RSS, and all of that stuff over there. And we just love hearing from you. Send in a boost. Tell us how you'd fix the big tech problem. And also, send us a contact. Coder.show slash contact. Don't forget we're live, too. Generally on Tuesdays, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, at coderadio.show slash live. And if that ever changes, we try to update it at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Lots of great shows over there, too. Thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Coder Radio program. And we'll see you right back here next week.